Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I wish. And uh, you'll see this and you can take this tour on your own. There's information on the left hand side that's that will be complement uh, the oral narrative that Amy and I are doing today. And you can take this at home. However, you really should go down onto the street and using your tablet or your smartphone, take the tour and it behaves completely differently. And that's one of the goals is to actually get down and wander the uh, Asian Pacific Historic District on your own. Uh, so with that, Amy, you would like to open with a few words? And this is for Amy. She might have gotten muted. Silent movie. <laughs> yeah, there I am. Okay. Oh, good, good. Okay. Um, my talk today will try to inform you about the experiences of my family during and after World War II and many other facets of my life growing up in San Diego. In the late 1940s and 50s, I will give you my recollections about places which are still in existence in Chinatown, such as the Chinese church, which is now the um, Chinese Historical Museum, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and Anqing Cafe. I will also include some of those places which are not in existence, such as the King Wing Store and Wu Chi Chong Market. I will try to give you a feel of how the area appeared to me as a young girl. I feel that without these recollections and experiences, some of this history might be lost. That's wonderful. I think I'm, I'm really excited to hear some of Amy's uh, personal stories. I did see a comment in terms of taking the tour. So for this session, you'll be just able to watch and look at the screens as I present and explain. So at the end, we can, you can take the tour on your own and I'll show you that QR code. So here we have, this basically tour is gonna be the eight blocks of the Asia Pacific Historic District. And so we're gonna be actually starting here. We're gonna be walking down Third Avenue, down to Market Street, come down. So this area is roughly the Harlem of the West. Walk back down here, over this way to along Island. This is where the Nihon Machi, the Japanese community was. Then we'll go down, uh, keep on going down here. The actual Japanese community is right here. Up here. Your cursor's not showing on the screen. Okay, can you see my cursor? Anybody? No, Michael. Mm -hmm. It's not. Okay. And your screen sharing is paused. Oh, interesting. Thank you, good. Hmm. I am. Okay, how about now? Is that showing with the yes. green cursor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Terrific. Okay, thank you. So actually, we're going to be, if you didn't see this, we're having this way, up this road, uh, down third, across island to fifth. A Japanese community is right here. Filipino community quarter is right here. Then back down here. And we'll end down there. All right. So what we're going to do is start at the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. You know, great, great starting location. This is really one of the, the, the central corner of, of old Chinatown. And so I'm going somewhat chronologically, but then actually jumping out sometimes based on where we're at physically. But really this Asian Pacific Historic District starts with, with, uh, with the Chinese. And so the His Chinese Historical Museum is a wonderful place to start. So this was actually, the museum was created in 1996, following efforts by, from the Chinese Historical Society of Greater San Diego and Baja California in 1987. So the organization um, rallied because this particular building here was threatened with being torn down. This was actually over on First Avenue where the Ralph's Grocery Store is. So, uh, the community rallied uh, with Dorothy Hom being our champion. And uh, so the museum was, uh, was the building was saved. With, fought, led by museum trustees, then the museum was started in 1996. You can see here, there's, there's a stone line. These mark the entrance of 
this particular block, and we call them the guarding stone lines, and they're affectionately called Alex and Agnes, after Alex Chuang, the founding executive director, and his fabulous volunteer wife, Agnes Chuang. So here is another view of the street that we're gonna be walking down. Here's, here's the other uh, stone line. So we'll be here, we're gonna be looking in the opposite direction to the south, and then heading down this way, going north. And I'll talk about some of those different buildings. So you can see here, what I'm doing is on the computer, I'm scrolling down the left-hand side, and you can see here that here's the map. So here's J Street, here's Third Street. And so if you're using this on, on a tablet or a computer uh, or uh, your smartphone, the map actually moves and so you get a sense of where you're supposed to be walking or where's you, where you're supposed to be looking. So I'll get started with the Chinese fishing industry because this is really where Chinatown gets started. So in the 1860s, the Chinese moved here because the fishing grounds were, were very productive. Um, you know, earlier, just as a recap, you know, 1848, uh, gold is discovered in California. A few months earlier, the United States uh, wins California from Mexico in the Mexican-American War. And uh, then shortly after, California becomes a state in 1850. So it's very much of a you know, frontier, wild, wild west. Uh, mining happens, explodes. Uh, travel from China is actually you know, easier in many ways than coming from the East Coast. So a lot of Chinese come to the West. They pursue mining. Uh, there's actually then a lot, a lot of, um, of um, discrimination and, and the violence towards the Chinese. So they start moving into different areas of, and fields and occupations. So they came to San Diego in the 1860s. You can see here, this would be roughly where the convention center is. And so these local coastal junks made out of redwood built here um, would have fished the local waters in the harbor or gone out to the local um, coastal areas for fishing for things like barracuda. And then abalone was a, was a prized uh, catch, uh, very much unappreciated in, in the United States but loved by Chinese communities in the United States or exported back to uh, China. Here is then a map of the 1800s. So this is a little bit more developed from the 1860s, but I wanted to show you. This is basically, it's a Sanborn map that shows 1888 San Diego. So there's multiple wharves that are sticking out. You can see here, you can roughly visit see downtown San Diego. Coronado is right here. And so this, this was the main wharf, the Pacific Steamship Wharf off of Fifth Avenue. So Fifth Avenue runs up here. Broadway is D Street. And you can see here it's wider. And it was designed as part of Newtown San Diego to be the central feel, it's the central street. Um, Alonzo Horton was very savvy. He, he saved this land for City Hall and Horton Park. And then here's City Park, not yet named Balboa Park. And you can see this little label here, New San Diego, because not too long ago, uh, it had been Old, Old Town was, was um, at the mouth of the San Diego River and a few miles away. So this was actually New Town. So here would have been right in this spot where those Chinese junks would anchor. So this was kind of the, a little soft spot, less desirable than some of the main streets along here. So this is where the Chinese really got started in the 1860s. And they were tolerated because they provided a valuable uh, food source for a small city of San Diego, only 2,600 in the 1880s. And uh, so, and then Chinatown really started creeping in along this stretch here. So you can imagine, you know, Horton Plaza, the shopping mall is right here. Gas lamp corridor is along Fifth Avenue and it runs up along here. So what ends up happening is with the Chinese uh, junks, they were successful. Some, some hardships, um, 
because there was you know resentment towards the Chinese and really a lot of of um, you know discrimination, uh, even though they were oftentimes the backbone and the workforce of the West. So in this time, you needed manual labor to actually build things, and so the Chinese were that that labor source. Uh, at some point, though, so, San Diego got much um, larger following the, the thing called the Great Boom, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the, here is then a scene about Chinatown. So you can see here, we're again at Third Avenue and J Street. So this is another Sanborn map, and again, it's, a, it's an insurance map. These are wonderful leather-bound books about three feet tall that you can see online uh, through the Library of Congress, and there's a link over here a little bit later. Uh, you can also go down to the San Diego History Center or the San Diego Public Library, and there are wonderful books to just browse through. You can smell the history behind them. These are Chinese stores and dwellings, so this is an abbreviation for dwelling. And this is the site that the Chinese Historical Museum is now on. Uh, it's also uh, pretty significant because this is where um, uh, leading uh, politician and community leader Tom Hom was born on this site, as well as Ah Quinn, which you'll hear about. He had a store right here. So going back along here, the Joss House is on the site of the CCBA building, and it was a Chinese temple at the time. So again, this is the late 1800s. And you can see here, Chinese wash houses were then a very popular business because that was an unserved need um, in this frontier town. And so the Chinese went into that. Also related to this time was the Chinese Exclusion Act. So I'll just say, so here's this, here's a, a text and I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So they basically said in 1882, Chinese laborers endanger the good order of certain localities and that Chinese laborers coming to the United States is suspended right here. It also clearly said that Chinese could not be admitted to citizenship right down here. So these were the things that many people felt this was an unfair, uh, legislation that attacked a specific nationality of Chinese. And so, and it was actually the first national law that targeted nationality. And then here to give you a sense for the, the kind of the hatred and the, uh, against the Chinese, this is a commercial ad. You can see the Chinese are viewed very derogatorily and they're trying to kick them out of the United States. So this is just a common add in from 1886. So as a result of this hostility, um, you know, many Chinese then went into their own uh, business or they, or they had low level service jobs. So the low level service jobs, they would be involved in construction. Um, during this time, the um, San Diego went through this thing called the great boom. So the Chinese were actually involved. So this is not part of Chinatown, but I want to talk about this. Um, in the early 1880s, uh, leaders tried to get a railroad line going from National City to San Diego, up through uh, Fallbrook to Riverside and through Temecula. And so that was actually built a lot by uh, Chinese railroad workers brought here by one of the first labor recruiters, Ah Quinn. And so that's actually a very significant element because having that transcontinental line meant this huge excitement and actually it was then over speculation during the time, but many uh, buildings such as the Hotel Del Coronado were built during this time because there was immense um, enthusiasm and speculation. And a lot of that was then triggered by this uh, railroad line. Unfortunately, that line ended up washing out a few years later. And so that actually doomed San Diego to become a, a spur as it was competing with uh, Los Angeles to be the terminus for Southern California on the transcontinental line. So because of the hostility, um, you know, Chinese went into becoming 
um, merchants, which was uh, one of the small permitted categories that the Chinese Exclusion Act allowed Chinese to stay. So um, you could become a laundry owner with relatively little capital and be able to um, control your own destiny. Uh, much better than being a lowly servant or um, uh, working for somebody else or a hard laborer. And then in terms of violence, I, you know, I do wanna say that there were a few cases of violence. There was some arsonists that targeted uh, some buildings in Chinatown, and, uh, but they were, they, that they were rescued by a, a committee, a volunteer firefighting committee. And, uh, but unlike other places, uh, like even Los Angeles, there was a 1871 mass massacre of, the, of Chinese in their Chinatown. And uh, that's actually a little known fact. Other mining towns across the West had a, a lot of uh, violence. And so uh, a lot of the Chinese then ended up retreating into the urban areas. So I'm gonna say here, here's a link that you can go to for the Library of Congress Sanborn map. And then I did wanna comment here. So here, the map ended up moving. So we were right about here. And so this is then the location where the Chinese junks were. And then in this time, Chinatown was really between the fishing shacks so you'll see fishing shacks if you go to the Chinese Museum and see some wonderful models. The railroad tracks were built and the railroad tracks are roughly there right now. And so Chinatown was more of this area. Since then, all these, all the buildings that were formerly Chinatown have been torn down. So really what's remaining at Chinatown is more up here. So I wanted to highlight then one of the significant buildings. So as you're walking down now, Third Avenue heading north, you'll see across the street, the Quinn building. So this was actually built in, let's see, in the 1888. And, um, and it's a wooden building covered in stucco, but this is owned by the Quinn family. So I wanna highlight uh, this gets into more depth in other talks, but Ah Quinn really was a pivotal leader in founding San Diego. He was brought down here to recruit the railroad workers, and then, you know, was savvy enough. He set up a store, and he opened up a restaurant. He was um, he was bilingual, and he and his one of his claims to fame is that he wrote many diaries. So he actually captures a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day activities of himself and the Chinese community in the late 1800s. And even so to the, to the point that um, he, he noted some things in San Francisco so that they can actually use some of his writings to recreate things that information that was lost during the 1906 San Francisco fire. And we have a friend of the museum, Dr. Susie Lynn Castle, who's um, writing a book analyzing his writings coming out of Stanford University Press, and hopefully that's gonna be coming out shortly. So here's the Aquin building. They ran then a produce business out of this, and they still own this building. So one of the few Chinese families that was able to actually own property. You can see from the Chinese Exclusion Act that it was actually you know, a difficult time and most Chinese were not able to own property. So here is the well-known photo of Aquin with his 12 children. And he lived on this block um, adjacent to the Quinn Produce Building. And then I figured, you know, this is, I thought was an interesting um, bit of information. So this is the census detail from 1910 of Ah Quinn. And you can see him, he's listed here at Third Avenue at 445. He lived here with his wife, um, Su Leong. And you can see here, it says wife. Their, their race is Chinese, CH, and then he had all his many kids. And so it would list the birthplace. So you can see here that Ah Quinn was born in China, his wife was born in China, and then his children were all born here in California. One thing while I have this up, it's not really relevant right now, is that this entry up here 
the census taker in 1910 found at 728 Third Avenue, there was a William Gilchrist and he was black. And so this begins to show glimmerings of the, uh, the shared multi-ethnic neighborhood that this area would become. So I'm gonna scroll on down and we're walking down Third Avenue. So here is the historic building of, of now known as the CCBA, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association building. Um, they are uh, an important and, and um, Chinese organization that represents the Chinese community to the greater, to the greater population. Um, and it also you know, acts to, to, um, to manage the community, handle internal disputes, and um, they are an important organization. Before this, a, a, an organization called Qigong Tong, which were known as the Chinese Freemasons, built this building. And here they're celebrating the Double Ten um, uh, Chinese uh, National Day in 1920. And then uh, in this building also, another important organization was the Chinese American Citizens Alliance. This banner here, however, says Native Sons of the Golden State, which, so this intent was to allow uh, citizens of Chinese descent to really have their own organization. So it was called Native Sons of the Golden State, modeled after a, uh, a native nativist organization called Native Sons of the Golden West. So not confuse those two because the Native Sons of the Golden West were anti-immigrant and um, whereas Native Sons of the Gold State became the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, a civil rights and, and um, immigration rights organization, and a place where uh, American-born Chinese could thrive and offer leadership. And here is a current picture of the CCBA building, and Amy has some comments about it. Uh, so when I was young, I would come down here, my family and I would come down here to participate in many social and cultural activities. They were all held upstairs. The bottom floor housed uh, other, several different businesses through the years. But what I remember the most about coming here was there would always be a Chinese movie going on in Chinese, going on through the whole time we were there. But since we were, we were kids, we would just run up and down the stairs and play games. But there would also, of course, be plenty of food. Um, I also took some Chinese language classes here for a period of time. And they would also have the lucky lion dancers out on the street for special occasions, as they still do now. Terrific. I did want to add a couple of things. One here is the San Diego Chinese Center operated here as a social service organization uh, providing you know, services for the Chinese seniors. And they started the Chinese New Year Food and Cultural Fair. Uh, the, the organization, the fair is now run by CCBA and is a wonderful opportunity every single year to get that, uh, see that public celebration and it's free right out in front of this building. And then two, just um, as a nod to many, many people, old timers call CCBA the six companies because in San Francisco, where they, when they were founded in 1882, CCBA grew out of a group of, of associations called the six companies. Um, and they were trying to fight for their rights because it was oppressive across California. And uh, that's, so that's the roots of CCBA, but they came to the United, they came to San Diego in 1920, 1921. So here we go, we're walking down the street. There was lots of stuff here on this Third Avenue. So this is Wuji Chang, and, and any of you who, you know, remember shopping at the Oriental grocery stores, this was the place to go. Um, uh, this store was in the middle of the block, built in 1898. And so you can see here that uh, this is courtesy of the uh, Han family and, um, and they sold Chinese merchandise and fancy goods in the front. And then they started having 
groceries in the back. Now we remember them, if you remember the stores in downtown or Kuni Mesa, um, that it primarily became a, a market. So um, the Chinese community would go back to the, to the back of the store to get the groceries. Um, the Wu Chichang was savvy enough so that they would actually advertise out some of their fine goods that to the general population. So this is actually a newspaper ad talking about the, uh, the fancy uh, treats that you could get or the silk embroidered goods. And so this was intended, of course, to the general American population. The Chinese would, would go in the back and then they learned how to make um, tofu. And uh, so they became the, the market part of Wu Chichang. Now, unfortunately, um, you know, the Wu Chichang ended up closing, but it's actually, you know, part of my, you know, I, I could almost make an argument that they were one of the reasons why the Chinese Asian district on convoy is set up where they're at because Wu Chichang was the first Asian and Oriental grocery store to move up into that area, uh, partially because there were, it was good land and there were some Japanese companies operating there at the time. So third and island is now, this is the historical element. And so you can picture the late 1800s, if this was still the Western town. This building here is the Wu Chichang building. And you'll hear about uh, the Gim Wing uh, store, which was another significant merchant at the time. Uh, but uh, further down, so we've actually walked down this street and now we've turned around and we're looking south. You can see here, there is the Chi Kong Tong building, and then another um, another building. So, so these two buildings still exist, and then on this site is where the Wu Chi Chang building is. And um, and Amy has a few words to say about that. Okay, um, so um, w when the oldest son. Um, that owned Wu Chi Chang. Uh, his name was Jennings Hong. He took over the business in the 1930s and he decided he wanted to expand the store. So it was moved to Third and Island. So right in the corner there, right. And um, um, this is where I would come with my, my dad at least once a week because he did a lot of cooking and he wanted to have, it. they had they had the merchandise, but they also at that point, they also had a lot of of um, market goods. Uh, so he would um, buy fresh Chinese food products such as meat, pak, bok choy, and tofu. So this was, like he stated earlier, this was a major Chinese market in San Diego. And you have to remember that there were less than 1,000 Chinese in San Diego at that time. So I would remember when I would visit the store, there was a very old man who I knew was the original owner because, um, which started in, I think in 1899. So anyway, he was the original owner um, and he had given it over, as I said, to his son in the 1930s, but he would still be there and he'd be there every day. And he did whatever needed to be done, including working at the counter, at the butcher or even sweeping floors. Okay, then also the Kim Wing store, um, which I understand is right, was right next to there, right there, was right next to the old Wu Chi Chong store. And so it was still there. <laughs> um, and it, but it was originally established in 1889. And on the outside of the store read Gen Chinese general merchandise, and it was owned by the Hom. Tam family, and it did did have many of the same things that that uh, Wu Chi Chong had, but they also produced their their own uh, produce in the backyard. They all they ran a Chinese laundry, excuse me, lo lottery, and tickets were sold until the lottery was closed in the 1930s. But also during World War II, they served as the mail address for local Chinese servicemen who had no permanent address. So as I said, the family lived in the rear and uh, on the, in, at the, in the second floor of the building. And what I remember the most about this store was it was obviously much smaller than Wu Chi Chong and it was, it was much narrower, but um, I would go there to mainly 
um, from like Chinese school or from um, Wuchi Chong's because they had dry fruits and candies that was sold by an elderly gentleman. And there were rows of them, of these uh, candies and fruits. Um, and looking back, um, I think that he was one of the original proprietors. Also, I'd like to point out too that um, I don't know if you can see it that well, it's hard to see in this picture, but uh, where people walked, these were all planks and that went right down to the ground. And I lived in another part of San Diego and I don't remember any other place in town that did not have sidewalks at that time. Okay. Terrific. So, and then what's happening right now is that there is a one-story building that's there that was actually housed Wu Chi Chang and it now house, houses the Cat Cafe on this site. So then as you're walking a little further down, you cross the street, here's the Ying An Association. This building was built in, in 1925, had a long association with different associations. The Ying An Association purchased it in the 1950s. So they are a mutual health business you know, organization. You can see that, that um, they have some flagpoles. A few years ago, it was, I always thought it was a fascinating. Um, they, would, they flew an American flag and a flag of, of the People's Republic of China. And so you know, they could show their um, political loyalties. I remember in the early years of the Chinese Historical Museum, um, you know, the museum leaders, including Dr. Tong, would really try to be, um, you know, not politically oriented because we were a charitable nonprofit association. So this is a very wonderful um, example of the historic Chinese influence in the area. They are not particularly active uh, right now. And then to the right of this, there was an old shack called the Yingon Annex, and that unfortunately was damaged due to a rain and this brick wall falling down about 20 years ago. So those were some of the earliest Chinese uh, buildings at the time. Walking further down the street, this is, a, this is one of the fascinating you know, buildings because it, it started off as hosting a Chinese um, restaurant and grocery, uh, the Chung Yun. Um, at some point though, it became the ideal hotel. So, th so you can kind of picture that you know, black travelers needed to have a place to stay because they could not stay at the, uh, at the white hotels. So this, this hotel was a segregated hotel where people of color and black travelers could go and this was a safe place. This was also home to the Harlan Locker Club and uh, since San Diego was a big Navy town, the, back, the black sailors needed to have a place where they could store their clothes. Again, they could not go into the white locker clubs. Those were, um, you know, off limits to them. So the Harlem Locker Club was a, a, a safe haven for them. So this gets into closer to Market Street. And um, so here's Market Street. And so I, I remember there was a, an effort years ago to name Market Street as Martin Luther King in, you know, Parkway. And, um, and I wondered why, and it's because the African American community had some really significant connections here at the time. So, um, but this image here is actually part of the city plan. So when the Chinese mission building was threatened with the demolition, the city, thankfully, and, and I'm sure with insights from, um, you know, Tom Hom, you know, realize, okay, they need to respond to the interests of the Asian American community. So they started this planning effort. So you could see here that this corner here was identified as the Chinese American Cultural Center, which is home to the Chinese Historical Museum. The Filipino American Cultural Center was home for the Philippine uh, Library and Museum. And then unfortunately, the Japanese community had mostly disappeared in terms of having a presence. But they developed this in the late 1880s, uh, mid 1990s. And Dr. Lily Chang actually was very significant among her many other leadership roles in chairing a uh, advisory committee uh, for this district on behalf of the city and the Center City Development Corporation. So out of this um, 
became a plan to have street lights that were Asian themed, special uh, sidewalks, and uh, the protection of the buildings. You can see here, there's just a handful, and that's why they officially call this the Asian Pacific Historic District, or thematic historic district, is because there's no longer a real high concentration of the, of the buildings. So now we're gonna be heading back down Third Avenue. Uh, I, in this area, if you are walking the district, uh, please note that there is a wonderful a dragon mural along Third Avenue that represents um, the Chinese history in the area. And Dr. Cheng was uh, instrumental at the getting the developer and the city to have something that, because they were tearing down some of the historic buildings in the area. So I wanted to point out the Stingaree District and Chinatown, they're oftentimes, you know, considered the same and, and they really weren't. This was the neighborhood, you know, you could see it's off of the main business district which is fifth and then the, the junks and were parked here, anchored. So this was a, a, a place where the rents were, were cheap. Uh, Chinese generally could not own property, so these were white landlords and building owners, you know, uh, renting uh, space to the Chinese because it was cheap. But then also the saloons started moving in. So the Stingaree District, as many of you, of you know, you know, was a place where you could get stung uh, going into the saloons and the brothels. Uh, and because the San Diego Bay was right there, previously there were stingrays and you could get stung by the stingrays. So the name migrated over to the stingaree. So you can see here that then in the early 1900s, Chinatown had really shrunk um, in the 1890s when that great boom was happening. Uh, there were 909 Chinese according to the census. By the early 1900s, it had dropped to 400, and other groups had then started moving in. So the Chinese Exclusion Act had suppressed um, the growth of the Chinese community and actually forced a lot of them you know, away. So you can see here along Fourth Avenue, there was things like the Yankee Doodle, Pacific Squadron, Old Tub of Blood, oddly enough, is where the Wu Chang building that you just saw a picture of. And uh, so, um, and during this time, you know, unfortunately, then the brothels, you know, did show up and that gives a kind of a sordid history um, to, the, to the neighborhood. Okay, so now I wanted to, just talk briefly about Chinatown and how it was represented at the exposition in Balboa Park. This is not actually in the district, but it's an important reminder of how negative the Chinese were viewed. So it, it was exotic. This was a attraction in Balboa Park at the 1915 exposition. They charged 10 cents to go in and you'd pay at this little booth here, you see, and then you'd enter this Chinese street and then it was a mysterious maze of vice where you could see gambling going on, opium use, and a Chinese slave girl. And these were all represented in wax figures, but it showed just how demeaning and insulting people were at, still at this time uh, towards the Chinese. Um, thankfully, they adjusted some of the marketing so that later on, this little, there's a notation in some of the historic books that says, this is not a fair representation of the Chinese in America anymore. And, uh, but this is actually how it was perceived at the time. So uh, the Bing Kong Tong building, um, this was another association um, that set up shop in, here in San Diego. And you can see here, it's very modest buildings. So this was, you know, a place where Chinese businesses uh, operated, oriental grocery stores, and for many years, um, and, you know, very modest, but it was a kind of a core part of the Chinese living um, in Old Chinatown at the time. So, Amy, um, you're next. 
Okay. Um, so, um, as you can see, I think by the time that I came down to Chinatown, which late 1940s, this had become, this area had become where Chinese residents lived, mostly um, Chinese seniors, because at that point, many of the Chinese families were moving out of Chinatown. Um, but these, these structures are most interest to me because I remember when there were residents there about, of, of one family who lived here. Um, they had a grandmother or great grandmother um, whose feet were bound, but she would, she would um, accompany her grandson, a great grandson, um, to Chinese school, and he was not very respectful of her. Of course, I don't think she spoke any English or understood anything, but um, he would say to her, move it, old lady. And I realized that he obviously was being very respectful of her, but what it really hit me was that she had, had bound feet and she couldn't go any faster. So just an incident. And, you know, and, and that is, you know, one of the, the his, historical elements of the Chinese, you know, culture. So if you could, if you could bound the feet of, of the woman, then that, then they did not need to work and doing manual labor. And that was a sign of uh, prestige and, and uh, wealth. So a few of them were able to come to the United States. Now this is the site of the Horton Grand Hotel. So this is one of the earliest hotels that um, moved into downtown San Diego and the gas lamp quarter. Um, and this is actually, a, these hotels were built during the great boom around the late 1800s. And then they were deconstructed, brick saved and then reconstructed on this site. So this, this took over the Bing Kong Kong building. So you can see here that I'm moving down. So we came down Third Avenue. We're now crossing Island. The Bing Kong Tong building was right here. And it's now you can see the gray footprint of the Horton Grand Hotel. So we're now heading over this way to this site here. And if you're walking in the neighborhood, you'll see the Davis Horton House. So um, William Heath Davis was the first on entrepreneur to try to get Newtown San Diego started. Unfortunately, it was just too early. So Alonzo Horton then was able to get Newtown established. So this is the home of the Gas and Quarter Historical Foundation. You really, um, they have a wonderful uh, lecture series and a great museum and they are really, you know, the experts in Gas and Quarter history. So I would encourage you to, to go there. On this site, it was then a mixture of some of the other communities. The Mabuhai Club was on this corner and the Hironaka Barber and Bath, uh, related to the Chinese, uh, Japanese um, community, was also here as well. So now we're walking down Island Avenue, and we're approaching. You would look up, and you would see a sign of with Chinese, with Japanese characters that say Pacific, but also those are Chinese characters as well. And so um, this is actually this building. The Callan Hotel, also known as the Pacific Hotel at the time, was really the central part of the Nikkei Business District or the Nihon Machi, the, the Japanese, uh, the, the Jap Japan town. And well, let's see. So if you walk to the corner, this is actually the building. It's a single resident occupancy. So this is where you know, Japanese would, would uh, live in small single rooms, sometimes with a sink inside, and then you'd have bathrooms down, um, down, down the hall. This is the type of housing that was then very common. You know, it was still a very heavily male dominated um, society. And so they needed to have you know, places to live. Um, and then so the Nippon, uh, company or the Nippon Shokai ran their store right here and they were the largest one in the 1920s, 1930s. There's some wonderful pictures in, in some uh, books and at the Historical Society about their history. Uh, Japanese Association of San Diego operated out of this building and so um, this was the, the 1920s and 1930s. Interestingly enough the Japanese community actually got started as early as 1887, and there was a store called the Goban 
up on Fifth Avenue, a few blocks away, that that opened up. And so the Japanese started coming here because uh, there was still the need for labor. The Chinese Exclusion Act was driving down um, the population. Um, and so the Japanese started coming here to fill the labor needs of, of California. And they were you know, quite successful all through the West and through California, because going into farming. Uh, you even hear a lot of, of, of our county's farmers, our most successful farmers, are of Japanese descent, such as uh, Chino Farms. Um, but what ended up happening is that after Pearl Harbor, um, there was the order 9066 to say anybody of Japanese descent must leave the West Coast. So 120,000 people of Japanese descent were ordered under very short notice to leave. They had to take care of their businesses, try to find somebody that would, would look over their property or their businesses. Most lost practically everything. They were allowed to carry one suitcase and um, they were ordered off. Um, and of course, then the sad thing was is that 60% of these individuals were uh, American citizens. They were born here. Um, and the order actually says that aliens or non-aliens need to leave. So alien makes sense. Non-alien, the opposite of non-alien is almost always you're a citizen, but you can't say in the executive order, citizens must leave and go to these internment camps. Well, relocation camps, San Diego City Council actually called them concentration camps. So there's no denying that this was a forced transfer under armed guards. Um, the Japanese uh, community then ev basically evaporated. They reported at the Santa Fe train station, went up to San Anita racetrack, lived in the stables there for a while. And then San Diego's Japanese community went to post in Arizona. So there's a strong connection. Um, at, at some point, you know, after the, after the war, um, they were really were, um, they came back, but in small numbers. And then there was a reparations effort. Uh, President Reagan and Congress did reparations in the 1980s. So they recognized that wrong. Um, after the Japanese left, then the Chinese were still active in the area and the Chinese were then, you know, um, considered allies because China was fighting um, alongside the United States against Japan in World War II in Asia. So the Jap Ch Chinese American market opened up. So here is the site. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment and give you a little view. So here I'm showing this, this book here. So I want to credit the Japanese American Historical Society and Professor Susan Hasegawa. And so if you want more information about the Japanese community, this is really the, the one to go to. So um, I, I credit them and I thank them. So with that, I am going to flip back to The Nankin Cafe, and so the Nankin Cafe was uh, was you know built um, in gosh, 1899, um, and uh, but at some point it was it was uh, bought by the Quinn family in 1927, and so uh, the significance of this was is that in 1927 also the nationalists established Nanking as being the Chinese capital. So it's very significant, you know, here's a small city in the United States and they're making a political statement that the Nanking Cafe is honoring. So there's again, you know, uh, some political connections. This historic sign, it says Asian fusion. It said Nanking Cafe at the time. And, um, you know, different hotels. So this was, this hotel was run by the Mitsui family as the Island Hotel. And then to the right of it was um, a tofu uh, house or a tofu bakery. So at that time, you know, we're used to buying tofu in small little chunks in the grocery store refrigerated. Back then they were built, they were produced in large sheets, two feet by two feet, and you needed to buy them fresh. And so, 
uh, on a tour of a, by the Japanese Historical Society, a, a senior recalled saying that they, um, you know, the, the Oyama family right here, they, they bought some tofu making equipment, but the seller did not share with them the recipe. So they ended up having to figure out how to make tofu, you know, at a production level. Um, and then I want to mention really quickly, historically, chop suey was, was the feature of the Nanking Cafe. So chop suey, early 1900s, uh, was, the, was the heralded food of Chinese cuisine. So, you know, we um, don't think too much of it now because we're used to the wide variety of different Chinese foods. But this was actually a very fancy and exotic. You could... They also advertised that this was a place where you could go dancing. So they would be open until 2 a.m. to try to take advantage of, of um, the nighttime businesses at the theaters a few blocks away. So this is, a, you can see how they advertised in the newspapers, 1928, very exotic look, but this was a place that you could go get entertainment. Uh, Amy, you, you're on next. Okay, um, so the Nanking Cafe was a restaurant that was m most important to me because when I was young, we came here frequently for both lunch and dinner. And, it, and inside was very retro. Um, it, uh, it was lime green throughout the restaurant. And as you came in, there was a, a very long bar, a beautiful bar across the front entrance of the restaurant. And then as you went in further, there was a big, huge jukebox. And um, you would go to your, your, your dining booth and they would, there were different booths, uh, you know, separate booths. And inside of each one of those booths would be uh, a roundabout where they listed all the jukebox hits of the day. So you would just press that button and then hopefully your tune would come up. Um, and also, we never really had to look at a menu because my dad would come in the door, go directly to the kitchen and talk to the cooks and they would um, get the dishes. We would, we would get the dishes that he asked for them to cook. And so we, that were ne not necessarily on the menu. Um, but I, uh, I also remember that when we, every time we would come into the front door, there would be a man an, a middle-aged man at the time who was sitting on a stool. And looking back, I think that he was probably Ah Quinn's son, Thomas Quinn, who had bought the restaurant, I think, in 1927. Okay. Terrific. So let's see. I am, so now we're, we're basically here at the corner. This is the Pacific Hotel. We're looking across the street at the Nanking Cafe right here. And now we're gonna be heading this way. So we're turning and now walking up Fifth Avenue to another building that shares uh, a really interesting past. So it was originally uh, some Chinese restaurants, most notably the Mandarin Cafe. And you can see it has an Asian style design along the top. Um, on that, Japanese Historical Society tour, there was somebody shared that they were called, this Chinese restaurant was a part of a Japanese American wedding. So uh, the bride got her hair done about a block away to the north at a, a Japanese hairdresser. Then uh, they got married at the Buddhist temple about a half a block away. Then they came down here and they had their family wedding banquet in this upper floor. So this shows really the intermixture of how the Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and then uh, Filipino Americans all coexisted. So later on, this became the Manila Cafe. So down here, there was you know dining downstairs, and uh, this is where the Filipinos laborers would come to hang out. So now we're getting into kind of a different time period. So. I talked about the Japanese American community from let's say 1900 to 1940. And then uh, laws against Japanese owning uh, land and property started kicking in 1918, uh, you know, California uh, uh, passed a law. And so the United States still needed to have laborers. 
but just as, as significantly, um, you know, the United States was becoming an empire of its own. So it had really been quite aggressive and went to war against Spain. So there was the, remember the main down with Spain uh, ship explosion that was used as a reason to go to war against Spain. And um, the United States won the Philippines from Spain. So now the Philippines was a, a protectorate or a territory of the United States. So the earliest Filipinos are actually here um, in just around 1903 as pensionados, basically coming here to learn uh, to get an American education so they could go back and, and help run the country of the Philippines. Now earlier, there's actually an interesting story. Um, October is Filipino American Heritage Month because October 1587, the first Filipinos actually arrived in Morro Bay as documented as part of a Spanish galleon fleet. So Spain, you know, having, having owned and controlled uh, the Philippines for so many years, they had a trade going back quite a bit um, to Mexico. And so there was that first reported landing in the United States by Filipinos. So that's why October is Filipino American Heritage Month. So let's see. So, Manila, uh, so then we have the pensionados, but California still needed to have laborers and the Chinese were being uh, tormented. The Japanese were, were being pushed out. So the Filipinos came in to work a lot of agriculture and service jobs. So this became a hangout for them as Manila Cafe. So another significant location was the Lincoln Hotel. So this building, another single resident occupancy hotel was where the laborers stayed. And then down here was the recreational restaurant space where they could, they could hang out. This was also the site for many years of the Philippine Library and Museum. You can see here, if you're walking around, there's a banner that says Philippine Library and Museum. And it was a great museum run by volunteers. I, I've been told that they just recently shut down. So now we're walking down Fifth Avenue. And I think with that, I'm going to flip over really quick and share this book here, <laughs> which is The Filipinos in San Diego. So I'd like to acknowledge, uh, you know, Judy Pataxel, Rudy Guevara, and Felix Toye, and the Filipino American uh, National Historical Society in the San Diego chapter. So this is the authoritative uh, book with a lot of pictures um, about the Filipino community. So I want to credit them and thank them for their support. And let's see. <coughs> All right. I'm back here and I'm scrolling down here. So as a, an important part of the Filipino <laughs> experience, and I hear some, okay, there was, there were dance halls. So uh, the, the Filipino laborers were here. They, they wanted to be able to, to um, enjoy themselves and, and, and have you know, recreation and dancing and music is an extremely uh, important part of that. So there would be these uh, dance halls where the Filipino workers, they would send taxis out to go pick them up. They had um, white or Mexican dance partners to dance with and then they would pay 15 cents per dance for about a minute to dance with them. Um, the reason I like this photo so much is that this shows the, the musicianship in the Filipino community. Harry and his band with a white singer, her name was Betty Boyd. And so this shows you know, the, that you know, some integration is going on, and, uh, but that this was a, a Filipino run um, band and they would have been typically one of the types of performers at the Rizal Dance Hall. Um, so this was actually if you're walking down Market Street, so we're now, we're at the corner of Fifth and Market and way over here, 
is a parking structure. That was the site of the Rizal Dance Hall. Uh, I mentioned that the Buddhist temple was here. So the Buddhist temple was about this mid block. The evidence is not really that clear, but, um, and I'm, I've not seen any pictures, but the Buddhist temple would have been right here. So this is then a mixture of the different communities And so talked about um, the dance partners. So, you know, Filipinos were then also kind of tormented and discriminated against. So they started trying to get the dance halls shut down. So what they, the dance halls instructors did is they put out ads and they said, okay, we're not, we're not doing dancing partners, this is uh, dancing instructors. So you can see here this ad in 1935 for two different clubs, the Rizal Club and the Manila Dance Hall um, to looking for dance instructors to staff and participate in the, in the, uh, in the taxi dance halls. There were uh, then a lot of you know, businesses that catered to the Filipino uh, workers, uh, pool halls, barber shops, uh, most of them lived a few blocks away down 14th uh, Street, uh, but their business center was called, was around Fifth Avenue and Market, and so it was called the Filipino Quarter. So here's a couple of sites in terms of Fonz and San Diego on their Facebook page or the national organization. So if you go up a little bit, so we were right here. This is Fifth and Market, I, if you go down there, you notice that they have some gas lamps that they have four gas lamps, really hard to pick up, but this was their nod to say, hey, this is called the gas lamp quarter. The funny thing is the gas lamp quarter is really just a marketing um, notation because gas lamps sounded elegant and historic, but during the time period, the early 1900s, there was plenty of electric lighting. And so there was very little gas lighting, but they needed to evoke a historic sense. And so the organizers, including Tom Hom, um, when they needed to redevelop and, and repair some of the, the neglect that had happened in, in downtown San Diego, they came up with the gas lamp quarter. So we're walking. So if you're on this tour, you do not need to walk down to the Quan Main Building and the Yuma Building. The Yuma Building was built during the Great Boom, one of a really remarkable structure. But down here in the lower floor, the Quan Main store operated. So Quan Main is actually a very significant um, you know, individual. He was a successful businessman. And initially when he arrived, the union actually did a little article that said they saw him riding a bicycle, calling him a celestial, but that was a demeaning term. His long queue described as a pigtail and his quilted clothes were strange. So this was in 1893, he was still being looked down on. But he was a successful merchant at the time. And he gradually actually moved and became more you know, upscale. He became the unofficial mayor of Chinatown after Ah Quinn's passing. And then for the 1915 exposition actually brought down a 30 foot dragon from elsewhere in California to perform at the exposition. So unfortunately, he was kind of being used in that sense the exposition at the time really just needed to have exotic elements. And so the performance was uh, part of that. And so I guess with that, um, Amy has a few words to say. No, not too much. Um, I do remember coming down here because it was a very nice store, very elegant things were in there. Uh, for us, we didn't really need anything because we had plenty of the those things in our own home. But um, I do think that it was much more, um, more Americans went there than Chinese. And, and, and so I, I, I think that they were the ones that really um, patronized it. And in fact, I guess later through the years, it moved to, to some really more upscale areas like La Jolla and Coronado. Yeah, that's, and, and I think he's a remarkable, um, you know, success story uh, during the 1935 exposition in Balboa Park. So now 20 years later, San Diego is having a second world's fair. And if you recall Balboa Park, there's that big secondary plaza 
uh, where uh, the Air and Space Museum is. Uh, by the way, they've renovated half that parking lot and they're gonna be opening it soon um, with, uh, with plants. And so it's not just gonna be a parking lot anymore. But that whole area, that was, came from the 1935 exposition. And I'm really glad, gratified to hear that unlike 1915, where the Chinese were viewed as strange, unique, and, and being demeaned, 1935, the community, uh, the organizers actually asked the Chinese community and asked CCBA to say, let's, uh, can you participate? So they actually visited the CCBA secretary and asked for participation. So that led to things like the House of China. And in this case, the Chinese community was able to represent themselves in their own way and not be suppressed. They had things like big uh, China Day at the Oregon Pavilion. And that was then an ability to represent themselves, um, the Chinese and culture at the 1935 exhibition. And Quan Main was actually successful enough at this time that he had two exhibits, one in the main exhibit hall and one at Spanish Village where he sold Chinese goods. And so he was a good success in 1935 and 1936. So now we're starting to walk down Market Street. Here's a famous uh, place called the Sun Cafe. It was really, you know, it was a, it was a, started off as a shooting gallery and then they started selling soup and the soup became more so successful that they actually opened up um, a restaurant called the Sun Cafe. So you can see here in this 1931, you know, section, it's running as a, uh, as a restaurant by the Jap by Japanese family, uh, the Obayashis, they got it started. And, um, you, you know, down here, this was one of the few cases where that we found where a, a Japanese family was actually able to own this property. And so $3,500 uh, was a transaction in the 1920s. The, the wonderful thing about this is that this was actually a place where multiple uh, communities could, could uh, dine. So there's some great photos, which I was not able to get access to, that shows um, white customers, black customers, and, um, and Asian uh, customers and staff all eating together at this counter. So here is the current photo. This was remodeled after that other picture. So this still exists. You can see it's called Sun Cafe. As a historic building, this bar um, came in and renamed themselves Funky Garcia's at Sun Cafe, but they've retained the storefront. And this photo was taken during the start of the lockdown. So I wanna thank my wife, you know, Priscilla Yi, for helping me capture this time um, of the present during quarantine. And even on some of the pictures, you'll see some of the current photos, people were wearing masks. So this was the time where I was preparing for my uh, thesis in this digital project. And then here, I'm really fascinated that the movie Green Book came out a few years ago. Green Books were traveler's guides where black travelers could find safe accommodations or safe businesses to go into because sometimes they would travel and of course in a segregated society there were unsafe places that you could go to. So the Sun Cafe you can see here is listed on Market Street as a restaurant you can go to. Then there were two YWCA's. If you're a black traveler in the 1930s, 1940s, you could not go to the, the YWCA's uh, for the white community. So this was the black community's YWCA on 29th Street. So if you wanna browse a little bit about the Green Book, then this site here will allow you to do that. And it's a pretty fascinating look at it. So now we're getting back into um, the African-American community, community and they called themselves Harlem of the West. It was still a small community, but because big, uh, a big performance place called the Creole Palace existed, they were very proud and they called themselves the Harlem of the West. So this was a place where leading entertainers would perform, Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, and then 
connected to this was the Douglas Hotel. So this is another segregated hotel where black travelers could go. There's a very nice plaque at Second and Market that represents the Harlem of the West. And it just goes to show just how multi-ethnic this area was, um, you know, 1930s through 1940s. Um, and then we'll start walking down. So here we were on Market Street and we're beginning to head back down on Fourth Avenue. So this street is, has many uh, Japanese businesses, uh, but it was also home to, well, early on, um, a Chinese herbalist opened up in this brick building. So in this site here, um, the Chinese herbalist had, had their, ran their business. And so Chinese herbal medicine, you know, it is a real, um, you know, legitimate form of medicine. Uh, you've, you, it, I visited a, a Chinese pharmacy in Beijing 10 years ago, and they had the, uh, the Western medicines in the front and the, and the Chinese herbal medicine cases in the back. And that was the, that was a, that was the pharmacy. Um, and so a, a Chinese physician or herbalist would prescribe the medicinal plants or other products. They would go to the store, they would grind it up into a powder and make a, you know, make a, a brew out of it. It's not a nice tasting brew because this is medicine, um, but it was a legitimate form of medicine. At some point, the herbalist here abandoned his, his um, herbalist cabinet and it got moved upstairs and it sat there for decades. And fortunately, at some point when they wanted to renovate this building, um, the owner contacted the Chinese Historical Museum. So when the Chinese Museum opens, you can actually go in and see this Chinese herbalist cabinet with herbs still in it, uh, with Chinese characters that, the, that, the, that identify the different um, yeah. ingredients there. So here was then, many old timers will remember the Royal Pie Bakery being in this place. So we're gonna walk down Fourth Avenue and start heading back. So, and then I do, according, I do wanna mention the Obiashi family opened up their restaurant here in this site. And uh, a sukiyaki dinner cost $3.25 at this time. And so interestingly enough, a lot of Japanese food became more popular because the United States was occupying and, and recovering Japan. So a lot of American service uh, men serving in Japan would come back to the United States and that helped kick off the interest in Japanese food in the United States. So now Chinatown is beginning to move on, but World War II really impacted the community a lot. So not only were there a growing number of Chinese families, then some were actually young, old enough that they could serve in the armed forces. So this is a wonderful picture, courtesy of the Han family. Jennings Ham is, is up here at top, and he's serving in China, along with some other San Diegoan Chinese. And they're actually in the Burma theater during World War II, working with the American forces fighting against the Chinese. I'm sorry, fighting against the Japanese. And so in this case, they were a wonderful connection to the Chinese troops and could really help uh, uh, improve coordination. Then they had other you know, Chinese American veterans. Gorman Fong is another longtime uh, member of the museum. He served in Battle of the Bulge. And, um, and so this is the way that Chinese Americans could prove that they were in fact Americans. Um, World War II opened up a lot of opportunities in terms of jobs. So because of the labor shortage, uh, Chinese um, um, young adults and could move into new jobs um, and, and it really you know, changed the complexion of the Chinese were now, being, were now viewed as being positive as, as opposed to being negative for so many years. So then the Chinese Exclusion Act was, um, was, um, was removed in 1943. And so that helped to expand the opportunities for the Chinese. So here we have the Chinese you know, community church. So recall that we walked by this building at first 
And the Chinese mission had actually started by um, as early as 1885 by the Presbyterian Church. So there were multiple schools competing to convert the Chinese. And the interest at the time was that they would go back and convert um, the Chinese in China. So this was basically a missionary effort. And this was very common in the early 1900s to be trying to convert, um, convert others. And so they wanted to convert the Chinese. Um, and, you know, attitudes eventually really uh, shifted. Uh, George Marston was very sympathetic um, and he donated the land on First Avenue for this building. And in 1925, the Chinese Community Church got started. And, um, and Amy has actually a lot to add about the church and the, uh, the happenings there. Okay, um, I was just going to mention, I think we forgot, but that's correct. Okay, I was just going to mention, you were talking about the exclusion laws, mm -hmm. and um, that my father was imprisoned. Um, he went to, um, uh, to, Nank to Shanghai right just before the war with my mother, and one of the reasons that he had to go there, he took a teaching position at Nanking U University because he was not an American citizen, and he could, could not get a job here because of the exclusion laws. So I just thought I would bring that in. Um, okay, so anyway, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, my uh, dad was the pastor here at the church. And um, um, as you can see, it was, it, the, the, this is a whole congregation. If this was 1950, I might even be, my dad and I might be in this picture. Um, but anyway, uh, my dad was passed to here in the early, late 1950s and early, late 1940s and early 50s. And um, he was instrumental in making this a Protestant denomination by renaming it the Chinese Congregational Community Church. So this made it part of the church. The church was part of the Council of Churches in San Diego. Also um, in the 1950s, I would come down here and take Chinese classes twice a week. Um, they, they taught Cantonese because you have to understand that most of the Chinese in San Diego at that time only spoke Cantonese because they were originally from the Kuangtung province of China. So we learned to speak, write, and, and uh, write Chinese using calligraphy. But most of the school, most of the kids that went to the school um, lived down in the downtown area, but we, we didn't. And so at the time it was quite a trek for me. Um, I would have to take a bus from school and then go through some many desirable, undesirable areas. Uh, one incident that I remember was uh, when myself and two other girls from a Chinese class who also lived outside of Chinatown, in fact, their, their father owned Chinaland Restaurant, um, were walking in the area where we were just north of Chinatown where many of the peep shows are housed. And we stopped in front of one of these theaters, which had a lot of scantily girl, uh, stressed women and girls. And a woman came out of the glass cage and she walked over to us and, and told us that girls like us should not be looking at pictures like this and sent us on our way. But it was my way of connecting with the Chinese community and attempting to learn the language. Okay, then I think, um, I guess this is, this is it with me, but um, the next part um, that I want to bring up is that there, there right after the war, there were many racial prejudices that my family and myself uh, suffered. Uh, right after the war. When my family first came to San Diego from China after World War II, they bought a house in El Cajon, but they didn't know that it was one of the most conservative areas in San Diego area. So when the neighbors realized that we were a mixed family, that is Asian and white, they sent out a petition over the whole neighborhood and had, and, uh, had all the neighbors sign it and we were forced to move out of the neighborhood. You have to understand that there was still discrimination in housing and exclusion laws, laws, I think, were still in effect. And not until the late 1950s and 60s were these discrimination laws overturned. Uh, they also helped to, the Chinese leave. I, I believe that these laws also helped the Chinese leave the Chinatown area. 
So we moved to City Heights after this and bought a house. But you have to remember, it was still right after World War II, and many people did not know the difference between the Japanese or Chinese. So the kids in our neighborhood would call us Japs. And uh, in fact, uh, one kid actually had the audacity to uh, ask me if my parents put a bowl on my head and cut my hair. But you have to realize, mainly, this occurred because we lived in a very white middle class neighborhood. Okay, and um, there's some more experiences I had. Um, I, has, I think it has to be stressed that both the church and um, the CCBA were the center of the social and cultural activities of the Chinese community. And um, I do remember uh, playing the Chinese national anthem at the church with both my father singing, me playing the piano, my father and my brother playing the violin. But um, the Chinese would also go out outside a lot when, when the weather was good, because you have to understand that both the church and the CCBA were very small facilities. And uh, one of the activities I remember was singing with the girls in language school at the House of Pacific Relations for the House of China. And the Chinese community, after we would present our, uh, our program, the women would bring out uh, their potluck uh, dishes, and um, they, not only would they come to the to outside the House of China, but other other areas of Balbo Park, is serving many delicious Chinese dishes. And my last little vignette, and I guess you'd call it, is um, there were quite a few banquets at George. George Joe's restaurant. This restaurant was downtown, but it was just a little outside of Chinatown. It was very nice decor, and most of the attendees of the banquets were leaders of the Chinese community. And on one of these banquets, where my dad had, for some reason, wanted me to sit next to the Keystone Speaker, who was at the time Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor of California. His name was Glenn Anderson. So we mostly talked about government and how it worked. And he had written a book about government, signed it and gave it to me. I think he, he might have mailed it to me later, but anyway, I got a book from him. And so coincidentally, a, month, a couple of months later, I was at a grand opening of, of the Democratic Party headquarters with my girlfriend and governor, the governor of the state, Pat Brown, was scheduled to appear. And when he got there, he asked if Amy Lee was here and he wanted to talk to me. So we talked for a short period of time. So I think that the Lieutenant Governor had told him about me. That's it. That's wonderful. Thank you, Amy, for those stories. A couple of points that you know, she shares is, is that the acceptance of the Chinese Congregational Church to the Council of Churches you know, that's part of the evolution where the Chinese went from being vilified to being, you know, accepted. Uh, the segregation still existed as Amy's personal experience uh, uh, provides, but this is then when those, some of those covenants were, really, were dropped and the Chinese were able to move to really, quite frankly, nicer parts of San Diego. So Wu Chi Chong moved out of Chinatown to 14th Street and then, as we know, later on expanded to uh, Kearney Mesa, Chula Vista in the 1970s. Uh, the Chinese Community Church moved out in 1960 to where more of the Chinese were on 47th Street. So then downtown becomes really the abandoned part. And this is, you know, this was happening in downtowns across the nation. So uh, oddly enough, sometimes that type of neglect becomes a good vehicle for these historic districts to remain because they remain frozen during these times. If, if it was an active neighborhood, let's say the gas lamp, people would be tearing down the buildings and putting up new buildings. But now the whole neighborhood was really being forgotten. Um, the, there were a few seniors who could not afford to move out. So they continued to live in the area. So then, as you're walking down Third Avenue, we're heading back. You can see across the street, the CCBA Senior Garden. So this was in the early 1990s, CCBA wanted to have a housing project. So to their credit, they have developed this uh, wonderful housing um, project for low income um, seniors. And so we're walking down Third Avenue and we're back at the corner of Third and J. And we're now back at the, um, 
at the second building of, for the San Diego Chinese Historical Museum, the Sun Yat-sen Memorial Extension. So this is where the rotating exhibits will happen. And so when you will hear, and if, please stay in touch with um, you know, the next exhibit that open up. This uh, installation here is a, is a statue of Emperor Qin, the first emperor of China. And uh, so, we want to kind of we want to end the tour because we are we've now you know done this route we're now back here and so i want to you know acknowledge that um you know this has been a great experience i want to thank lily uh, birmingham um and and lily cheng for their leadership and um and i also all want to highlight that um Prior to this, a lot of this information was built on book by Murray Lee. So I won't show the book, but I think it's a well-known fact that Murray Lee wrote his Chinese in San Diego book. And so I consider him to be the Dean of Chinese American history here in San Diego. And you can also then look at the website. So if you wanna record this, it's a little bit shorter. Uh, and I will conclude, so this is the QR code. And so if you take your smartphone and you have a QR reader or your smartphone is within the last couple of years, the camera automatically recognizes that you have this QR code. And so it will bring up a website. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more, but this gives you the opportunity to bring out your smartphone, see if you can use a QR reader. And so, um, so with that, I wanna you know, thank my partner in presentation, uh, uh, Amy, Amy Thank Lee, <laughs> and so she here is noted. So if you want to see the oral history project and her full interview, uh, you can go to this the museum site and see her full oral interview. But there's also many other things. So I want to credit uh, Elizabeth, who has led our oral history project at the museum. This whole um, digital history project is built on my thesis from Underground Chinatown to the Hall of China, Chinese Representation at San Diego's 1915 and 1935 Expositions in Balboa Park. So a lot of the information is referenced here uh, from my thesis. And so as a good historian, you know, um, I thank the museum, San Diego State, and Filipino American National Historical Society, uh, my wife, Cristelda, but then also, I also include the historical sources. So if you want to dive in and learn more, then these are these historical sites to go to. Uh, with that is a call to action. So your, your um, mission is, is to use the QR code that, or type in the URL and actually go to the Asian Pacific Historic District in this time of, of lockdown. Oh, um, you can actually go there and wander the district yourself and use a smartphone and get a different feel for this virtual walking tour. So again, I thank you for uh, listening and, and I'm very open to questions as well as Amy. So I will unshare. <laughs>